Hi there, I'm Anthony Chung and I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading. Every weekday morning I'll deliver a fundamental rundown ahead of the European Open. But if you subscribe to the channel, you'll also get content from the rest of the team. So, let's begin. Okay, very good morning to everyone. Hope you're doing well. It is Thursday 26th of November and of course for any of our US listeners, Happy Thanksgiving. Do take care and enjoy what I'm sure will be an extended weekend for you. Um, otherwise, thanks very much for everyone who joined us last night on Amplify Live for the masterclass with Nick Baker. Uh, if you did miss it, I did record it and I'm going to upload it later on this morning so you can all access and review that uh, if you need to go over it again. But otherwise, let's just get straight into what's going on in the overnight session. And obviously, when it is Thanksgiving, things are notoriously quiet. US markets are closed, so no trade uh, on things like the NYSE or the CME floor, things of that nature. There is electronic trade, which sees an early close at 6 p.m. London time. So right now, um, you can still trade uh, US index futures, for example, but the idea being is that this is where you need to recalibrate slightly your approach to the day because a major continent is out of the market. So. Uh, that's a really meaningful point, I think, for the for the briefing today is if you are fairly new to the, the day trading environment, you have got to be adaptable to the market conditions. Uh, and if you think about generally markets and how they've been operating of late, it varies uh, very much so is US centric. And so the fact that the uh, US participants are out of the market today then means that it's likely to be particularly quiet barring anything unexpected that develops. And that's also reflected on the economic calendar. Um, everything was really squeezed into yesterday's session. We had that kind of data deluge, if you like, that came out. But now that that's passed, there's really not a great deal going on, uh, both um, today, but also just going through the news from my perspective this morning, there's not a lot going on either. Um, just given the fact that, again, a lot of those people, even on that side of the table, uh, are also away. So having a look at things as they reside at the moment, there was a a uh, bit of a divergence between the close on the US indices, albeit fairly moderate. Uh, the NASDAQ has continued to outperform. And uh, I guess let's just have a look at the NASDAQ and the S&P just as an example. And I want to look at the NASDAQ on a daily continuation because I just think it gives a nice kind of narrative to uh, where we are and where we've come from. And, and certainly the US election, uh, that idea then of you know Biden coming in, but not having a blue wave scenario. Uh, meaning that a lesser, tighter or stringent regulatory environment for some of these, uh, particularly these mega cap tech names. And then, of course, we've had the, the pandemic kind of rage on in uh, North America, and that has created then still some appetite, at least at this point, for uh, those tech related kind of pandemic plays uh, on a sector level. And so the tech sector continues to, to outperform uh, on that on that side of things. And after we had that breakout, which really came uh, earlier in the week, uh, above what was uh, the area of around 12,021, that coinciding with a horizontal resistance, but with that trend line coming in from uh, the initial September high, the October retest, the failed kind of sustained move that we saw in the early part of November, uh, it's just continued to just edge higher. And where we are at the moment, coming up to close proximity back to that high we printed on the 13th of October, uh, that would be up around 249. And then the inevitable push back up to the all time high, of course, uh, which was seen at, at 12,465 spot two. So uh, the tech side of things uh, continues to, to see a pretty decent performance. Uh, obviously, we continue to be vigilant, obviously, for updates on the, uh, the COVID side, the vaccine side of things. And there is a little side point I want to make about the uh, COVID situation um, when we get to it in a moment. Uh, otherwise, this morning, a uh, continuation of the dollar trend. And I just want to quickly switch over my charts. Uh, this is a look at the, the dollar index. And we had that push down what was that really key 92 level. Uh, this would have been right back at the beginning of the week. And that was met with some really strong buying that came in and we kind of bounced up quite aggressively. Um, but we've kind of held the view um, that the dollar is on a weakening trend at the moment. Um, that's been pretty evident ever since the onset of the pandemic, really. If you start going back on a, 
a longer time frame chart here. I mean, here we are up at around the dollar peak that we saw momentarily on a flight to quality move uh, that came initially, which saw us test up at around that high of 2017. And then therefore the highest that the dollar had been trading since pretty much 20 years. However, the realization then of the, the kind of domino effect of what that means for ultimate monetary easing on an unprecedented scale just saw the dollar get hammered. And here we are, and we still remain of that mindset. The whole reason with the Dow push to 30K just the other day was kind of based on a lot of these elements. Uh, the Fed uh, undoubtedly going to stay in ultra accommodative mode, and that's even more assured now with the likelihood of Janet Yellen coming in to steer the ship on the government side as the Treasury Secretary. Um, the confirmation on those other things that we had, of course, on, on the Biden side. But the idea that um, this lower for longer mentality uh, and also the pivoting of any of the funds coming out of those underutilized Fed programs means that it puts more pressure on the Fed really to support the market, particularly in a situation where economically, as we saw with jobless claims yesterday, things are going to get materially worse in America uh, as restrictions uh, take hold to try and counteract this recent wave we've had of, of COVID cases. So. The dollar still sits at this really key kind of area. Um, again, we're looking at a very longer time frame chart here going back to the last 25 years or so. Uh, and you can see the relevance as we've pointed to before in 2016, the kind of resistance that we had in 04 and 05. And so um, there's still, I think, um, some room to go for this, this dollar move playing out under the same uh, scenarios that we've mentioned. And, you know, if a vaccine does come out, uh, I don't think we're anywhere near the point where people will start panicking about, in, you know, rising inflation expectations and ultimate Fed tightening. I think, if anything, it's just um, lesser need to be holding US dollars uh, in that respect. And particularly as well, a lot of people have talked about uh, the pivoting out of the US, given the divergence of COVID timing, if the rest of the world starts to recover, i.e. like in mainland Europe, for example, well, is the euro just a more favorable trade anyway on that dynamic, given that the US COVID situation is almost a lagged uh, effect of multiple weeks behind what the situation is in Europe, which adds to that, um, that directional bias for negative, if you're looking at the dollar supportive, obviously, if you're a dollar. Uh, and on that note, just having a look at euro dollar, uh, we have managed to push above what was that initial Pfizer peak high. You can see if I just move my chart over a little bit. That was that initial Pfizer pop that we had. So we're above there now. Uh, did uh, encounter a little bit of resistance yesterday on multiple occasions, but just going into the late Asia European Open here, we've just seen a bit of a breakout with the dollar. Uh, just easing once again, the Dixie's down about just over one tenth of a percent. And looking on the euro on a daily then, uh, we're getting above what is really a key, uh, rather large, but consolidation range that we have had. And we're starting to see a bit of a breakout onto the upside. And so 119.41 here on the daily continuation in the futures, just looking to see a bit more of a uh, substantial move above the peak of where we were in mid sep and on that Pfizer top that we saw on the 9th of November. So here technically on the upside then does put an obvious target up at around 120, which was that area, if you remember, is when the ECB started to voice concerns uh, in early September and to try to counteract and push the euro back down. So be interested to see how that plays out over uh, the coming sessions. Uh, similarly then, not so much because of Brexit headlines, but I would say more, uh, well, it's partly due to the overall top level view that ultimately a deal is going to get done with Brexit, but also in the backdrop of this weakening dollar, cable continues to just grind it out on, onto the upside. And yeah, on the intraday, I guess there's a couple of interesting levels. We've got this kind of range here we're looking at on the upside, the 134. On the downside, you've got this range kind of high and low that was um, in play for this week. So if I was looking at the price bands at the moment for cable, this is what I'd be looking at in the short term. And then we'll have a look at the long term in a second. So let me just color this up so it's as clear as possible. So we're just trading here after getting above it yesterday afternoon. It's really just in a phase of consolidation. So a break on the downside 
uh, be looking for down to uh, a push back down to around those initial lows that were seen at 74 and then uh, back down potentially towards pivot on the upside we've had three attempts now up and around the 134 handle uh, that being that high on Monday session as well as yesterday and any breakout then might continue that trend so look, keeping an eye on the dollar really for a trigger point if that was to materialize on a daily continuation obviously cable just um, keeps going and that 134 obviously quite key because we were just looking at a more zoomed in 30 minute chart and we can see that was the high that we printed uh, back on Monday but that 134 not only psychological for the handle but that was also the highs that we were printing on the 31st of August and the 2nd of Sep. So it is a meaningful level. A breakup above that then does open up the prospect to potentially just a further continuation of the, the upside trend of what has been a pretty phenomenal month really for sterling over the course of November given the, the kind of doom and gloom over will they won't they on Brexit. I mean sterling has gone from pretty much a 129 handle up to a 134 handle. So I think that says it all really about the general market's feeling about the idea now on the or the probability being relatively contained for a no deal Brexit type scenario. Um, on that front, just talking of Brexit while we're there, uh, this was the latest obviously from yesterday. The European Commission President uh, van der Leyen said that coming days will be decisive for trade negotiations with the UK and crucial differences between the two sides still remaining. Um, negotiations are continuing virtually. This comes after one of the European members um, was positive for coronavirus. But face-to-face -face contact is expected to resume in London before the end of the week. Officials on both sides have expressed optimism that the agreement is possible and could be reached by the end of next week. I thought they said it was going to be the end of this week. So, you know, here it is again with Brexit. And if, if the penny haven't, hasn't dropped yet, just... You know, what politicians say uh, and how I think you can strategically think about how a negotiation develops, uh, I don't think it's rocket science. You know, every week we've been told that a Brexit deal is going to happen and every week the can gets kicked down the road. I think it's completely unsurprising. Uh, and in fitting with one of the calls that we've been saying, which is that we foresee a deal happening in mid-deck to potentially even right at the 11th hour at the end of December, um, the idea of it being ratified in Parliament uh, across the various different European nations and that formality kind of procedural process to take place. You know, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, that's what I've always said is that that can always be that kind of uh, transitional period coming out of transition into the formal um, free trade agreement can always take place. Uh, and that's been ratified from overnight. Uh, the EU is reportedly weighing now holding extra uh, plenary sessions on December 22nd and December 23rd or just after Christmas the 27th and the 28th to debate and vote on an EU-UK deal if one materialises. This is according to an informed source being reported by an FT Brussels correspondent. So Europe are already now talking about holding these potential sessions book ending literally either side of Christmas which for me again means that a deal, if it's going to come, is going to be uh, pretty late in the day. But I don't think that's any room to panic necessarily. Uh, I think the market price, let that be a reflection of market's general sensitivity to this. That does not mean that if a headline breaks here or there, it might not have a meaningful reaction on the pound. And the way I'd interpret that is that if the market is expecting a deal, uh, and cable is relatively high at the moment, uh, particularly given how aggressive it's rallied in November, well then the bigger reactionary effect would be to the downside if talks were to materially de deteriorate. Um, could that happen? Well, remember, I don't think deterioration in talks means that there's going to be no deal, but deterioration could take the form of looking to leverage and posture to get a better deal. And so the political kind of jousting that goes on undoubtedly in a day trading environment can have some um, turbulent waters let's say for sterling if you're trading it so you do still need to be aware of it it depends whether you're trading the very short term um, you know if you were trading today I think this goes for all assets uh, you've got to be pragmatic and pretty patient and disciplined um, likely to be a day of which technicals are respected perhaps range-bound, more conservative plays 
uh, are a more prudent play because of the fact that the US is out of the market. Uh, and then just being vigilant, you know, if there is any Brexit comments come out, you know, just making sure that you're aware of what's going on, that's all. Um, so, quick look at some other things. Um, on the news side, we had the FMC minutes last night. Uh, as you can see in prices, absolute non-event, uh, as we were expecting. A couple of things to take away. Uh, the Federal Reserve officials discussed at their early November meeting uh, about providing more guidance on their bond buying strategy fairly soon, though they did not see a need for a immediate adjustments. The Fed's next scheduled meeting, of course, comes in mid-December, 15th and 16th. Now, I actually think that that's quite interesting as a time frame because by then we probably would have seen if there's any, uh, any uh, meaningful pickup in COVID cases after the back of this kind of potential super spreader event, which is Thanksgiving, given the incubation period, it could be then that fir- end of the first week going to second week, which is just then going to the Fed meeting in mid-month that we could then see if there is a, a meaningful pickup uh, giving Thanksgiving. Uh, and then also as well, I think a lot of this market momentum, particularly in the equity space, has been derived from kind of uh, a sequence of positive, generally, uh, vaccine news. The only problem with that that I could foresee is, you know, the market's almost hungry now for, for continuous positive little catalysts. Uh, and we might well, that might well start to run a little dry. <laughs> And if that does happen, then again, I'm not, I'm definitely not bearish. I just think it just lacks them that momentum to just keep pushing higher. Um, overall, they still remain fairly, fairly bullish, even at these levels in, in equities. But as we were saying yesterday, and something that we were talking about in the Amplify Live room was, um, you know, the S&P really was a case in point, which was, well, look, if the, mar- the market soared, um, the prior day, just almost the kind of animal spirits being unleashed, uh, breaking out over key levels, the Dow 30K and so on. And so the other US indices f- followed suit. But ultimately, what you tend to see in a day behaviorally after that is a, is a bit of a pullback. Uh, and if anything, a, a pause for breath, a period of consolidation. And uh, this was that rectangle uh, we were looking at yesterday, which was that double top that we had from 17th, 18th. And that coincided with the pivot from yesterday. So it was quite a nice entry point then, given the scope of the pullback that we had, retracing almost 50% of the move that we had in the prior session, to then just get in back long again. Um, and you know, the, some of the best trades that we've, we've had this week have been those where they have required a lot of discipline. I know Tim had a fantastic trade on oil, uh, where uh, being long but just waiting multiple hours for that eventual uh, breakout and when it came you know it shifted a decent dollar dollar and a half in move and similar sort of thing here with the S&P uh, I know there was one or two that did take that and they ha- they've had to sit in it uh, for quite a period of time up until the close but you know eventually it has got up there and you know we're talking you know 15 points in the in the S&P um, I know that seems small in the, the context of 2020, but for a, for a trade, obviously, that's that's good stuff. So, yeah, it's this this next session or two. I, I think just given the fact that Friday as well, typically uh, numbers in terms of volume in the market does remain particularly low because most people in America just take it off uh, to make use of that extended kind of period of the weekend to really enjoy Thanksgiving with their friends and family. So. Um, Yeah, just got to be mindful of that as we go through the session. The other thing then, I did talk about the importance of still tracking uh, the vaccine news. I am actually going to be filming um, the video that I promised on Monday, if you are following me on Twitter, which was in regards to um, doing a 101. What have you got to know about vaccines, the timeline, all these other types of things. So I'm shooting that today with one of the chaps on the team. And we're going to look to put that out, hopefully, tomorrow morning. Um, but in the meantime, just in case, um, Moderna shares were up uh, another 10%, hitting a record yesterday. Investors are waiting the final analysis of its COVID-19 shots. If you remember, we had Pfizer, 9th of November, part one. And then we had the secondary follow-up of the kind of the next level of the same testing that came out to ratify the first results. Uh, which showed the efficacy rates were even higher than the first time. So 
Um, it's not like a one and done result process. They continue to obviously test and, and, and bring out latest numbers. And so one of the things here is the final look at Moderna data is expected within days. So something to be aware of. Um, this comes after 151 volunteers in the 30,000 person study develop symptoms of the virus. And so therefore they can calculate then the effectiveness and so on. It would be the final step before filing for emergency use authorization. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out here though was that Moderna, if you remember, um, their shot was found to be 94.5% effective in the preliminary assessment. So for me, the upside potential um, is limited because the effectiveness was so good the first time round. I mean, what is it going to come out at 95%, 96%, 97%? I think that doesn't really make a great deal of difference. If I'm thinking with my uh, news impact hat on, the risk is to the downside. What if for some reason it drops to even an excellent, otherwise 85%, our reference point now is 94.5%. So I would say upside uh, on their latest update, as and when it comes, is going to be relatively um, small. Potential downside could be very large. So that's something to be aware of, uh, as and when that news does, does eventually come out. And then just looking at the calendar for today, I mean, it is super quiet, um, as you can imagine. Uh, there's nothing really going on from a data perspective. You've got the ECB minutes at 12.30. Uh, again, not really expecting that to be market moving and then nothing coming out of the States. Um, finally, from a COVID update, a few things to be aware of, just so you're totally up to speed. Uh, in the US, California is obviously one that we watch quite closely, just given the, the size of its economy for overall national kind of output. Uh, they reported more than 18,000 new coronavirus cases yesterday. That was a new uh, and largest one-day record that we've seen in that state during the pandemic. Um, President-elect Biden has urged Americans to basically forego Thanksgiving. Obviously, whether that gets adhered to or not, we'll find out, And as I was discussing uh, a moment ago in the coming weeks. Um, elsewhere in mainland European UK, Merkel... Uh, and the leaders of Germany, 16 states, have decided to extend the partial shutdown imposed for the month of November until basically just before Christmas, so December 20th. And in the UK, uh, not that I think it's particularly meaningful for markets right now, but something to be aware of, Whitehall sources have told The Telegraph that London will be in Tier 2 after the lockdown, despite signs that infection rates uh, have started to fall. Uh, and remember... The tiering system is generally much more stringent than it was in the previous tiering system. So tier two under the new system is pretty much similar, I would say, to what we're we're experiencing right now through most of the months of November. Uh, the PM, as per what they outlined on Monday, due to give the kind of geographic tiering uh, update at some point later today. Um, and just as I finish talking of sterling, just a little breakout here of that, that area of range that we were talking about. So here you can see breaking out of that range, I can't see anything on the tape that's particularly new that's come out um, related to anything sterling, but from a technical perspective, having that range break, markets have come down, and again, we already have these levels marked up, that pivot level, 65, um, kind of 64 in the futures, uh, and so, yeah, this is the kind of day that I think that you can expect. And so that's why the technical um, framework of the charts is really important today. And, you know, as well, keeping an eye on things like gold, it's had a bit of a run up and a rejection so far, but around the R1, which is close proximity to, to yesterday's high. So here again, if we did break above here, where next 25 good area here from the, the low on the bounce on the overnight on the 24th. Big, bigger level, I'd say, at 34.5, which was that uh, low on Monday, the recovery high then that I saw the following day. Uh, on the downside, got this trend line in play on three tests that we've had over the last 24 hours. A breakdown through here. We're looking down to the, uh, the double bottom from earlier in the week on Tuesday going into Wednesday night, which was just above that psychological, psychological 1800 handle, which we know on the higher time frame is just sitting above that 200 DMA, which of course is key um, for the rest of this week to hold as an area of support for price to consolidate or recover. All right, that is it guys. Gonna let you get on, have a good day.
and I'll see you in the Amplify live chat room.